in this regards, we know for a fact they're going to abuse their authority. If they go to whatever standard it is, they are going to abuse their authority to do whatever they want. So I, I personally feel that every single person, doesn't matter whether it's Australia, UK, Finland, America, Canada, wherever, I don't care, this needs to be blocked. Welcome, of course, Edge Radio Australia. It is time for the Greater Wealth. I have, uh, look, an amazing little cast today. What can I say? I've got on the line all the way from the US of A. I'm going to run through things here. We've got uh, now Kimberly Calhoun. Is that how we pronounce your name? That is correct. Thank you, Kimberly. You see, I have, uh, thank you, Kimberly, and I just want to call you Kim from this point onwards. I have a history of absolutely butchering people's names. So, uh, yeah, please take it. I'm very, very, um, well, quite frankly, I'm, I'm really excited to have you as part of the show as a regular these days. Now, how would you describe your uh, your expertise? How do you come in here uh, in your own words? Well, I've just had years of um, running businesses and right. I have worked with a lot of institutions on inspiring financial literacy. That's one of the reasons why we started a, a TV show, Nick, um, one of my business partners and I. And um, I just, I love working with people and sharing information like what you're sharing so that that's kind of how i got i mean i'm i'm a many years engineer that's how i started my career um invented uh many products that uh law enforcement wants to use and um started up a telephone company raised 134 million dollars in one swing um, so those, you know, and I sit on university boards and try to help them raise money. So okay, so pretty much a, a serial underachiever. I can hear that. Um. <laughs> Very much. You know, I'm, I'm still searching for that. Well, you, right you're doing an career. amazing job, really. Are now, as I say, to my left. Uh, look, I've got the star of the show. What can I say? Uh, the and when I say star, the man, the legend himself, with the Blue Sky Factory, Derek Whitaker, mate. Good to see you. Great to see you again, Aaron, oh, mate. Now, let's give it a little quick little run through. You give yourself a little bite. What, do you, what have you got for us? Wow, where do I start? Okay. I mm-hmm. uh, used to work in radio. Funny, I'm back in this game. Um, and while I was working on radio, I was also trading the stock market, not known to my boss at the point at the time. Right. And uh, losing lots of money like people do. Got his, out. his money or your own? <laughs> my own money. <laughs> Damn. Making your donations to the market, as traders yeah. put it. Uh, got out of that game into the finance industry, complete breakaway into a different industry. Yep kid in a candy store, learning all this stuff, got to hang out with amazing traders, all interest was always in, in that. And I had guys teach me how to mentor, uh, mentor me, learning how to make thirty to $40,000 a month. They showed me their techniques. Fantastic. And then somebody said to me, you need to teach this stuff. So I right. did. And then later down the path was starting my own business and doing that. And then somebody came down the line and said, you know what, um, I ended up, you know, I want to start a hedge fund and can you help me do it? And right. went from there. So... Yeah, it's been quite a wild ride. It certainly has been. And like the the crossing of the different sort of genres, but always in the finance game, one degree or another. Mm. And and funny with the um, the media point of view, with the journalism and radio full stop going full circle. Yeah. You know, and you've ended up where you belong. Here at Edge, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, now, after two fantastic, illustrious people going through you know, a great bio, uh, we're going to change the tone a bit and uh, talk about Travis Carter. Travis. What, what, how would you describe yourself and your contribution to this little uh, round planet? He's property investor extraordinaire. Yeah, I think that's fair. Oh, no, 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 no. Let, let's, let's get this correct. The, the, my official title is Dead Set Legend. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Attack Helicopter, but that's a whole other story. All right. Oh, yeah. um, no, no, no. Uh, that's actually real, by the way. Um, yeah, no, property investor, one of Derek's students for options trading. Uh, and by the way, for because Derek never does this himself. He's too modest. If you do want to learn about trading, please do head over to blueskyfactory.com.au. Now, blue does not have an E. Don't ask me why. That's a Derek question. Uh, so B-L-U-S-K-Y factory.com.au. And you can actually learn all the strategies that he uses. Um, brilliant courses. So please do make sure you, make sure you do do it. How's great, this great, great plugs after plugs after plugs is hilarious. I know. Um, I, I will actually throw in on that. I, I've had, uh, I haven't delved as far as uh, Mr. Carter over there, but doing uh, uh, some of your courses, mate, it has actually t- 
totally changed my attitude to money and uh, my understanding. Full stop. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's been it been a big deal. So I think that and and hasn't uh, fixed your dress sense, though, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I've only just started. We didn't mate. do the fashion chat. No, 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 yeah. that's next week. <laughs> next week. But I think if you actually really do understand uh, the systems of money and and you know, a lot of the myths that we we live our lives by, um, yeah, you can really well you can check things differently. You can chase your well. Your greater wealth, funny enough, in a in a in a far clearer way. Mm. All right. Well, from my point of view, hey, I won't um, babble on too much. Uh, broadcaster for a very very long time, obviously with uh, uh, radio and uh, video and, and audio as well. Been um, self employed many many times and uh, had quite an industry. Uh, well, sorry, quite a life in the uh, entertainment industry. That'll do. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, look, investor. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, made certainly some, entrepreneurial. Yeah, and we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah. Like, certainly, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, entrepreneur you know, I, uh, and car wrecker. And car wrecker. Oh, yeah, there you go. There. <laughs> Former pro rally driver. Uh, so, car wrecker, yes. Uh, no, yeah. look, I think it's really important to you know, grab life by the proverbials and uh, and go by and live horns. it. Simple by as the that. horns, Aaron. Aaron, kids yeah, show. Yeah, by horns. The horns. Horns, I like that. All right, now that we've just had the love in, let's jump into the show. We've got some great stuff to talk about today. Uh, we'll, we'll start soft because this is something I don't actually know a lot about. And on uh, on the surface, I'd look at this and go, oh, geez, they're not paying their taxes kind of attitude. Um, believe it or not, I'm probably going to dive in and ask Travis a couple of questions on this. But do you want to... Before get we get started? to I'll just let people know that um, we're going to get into some big developments as far as crypto is concerned this week Very and also happening in the EU, some big mm. developments there. But before we do that, Travis actually sent me this really interesting article where the ATO were kind of justifying why some businesses don't have to pay tax in a financial year, yeah. which is a bit of a turn of events Just like when me. you've got a collector uh, justifying that. Um, so what it basically highlights is a lot of people don't understand that companies don't always uh, aren't always taxed. And they're often criticised by that, and, and they don't really understand why they're criticised by that. Well, certainly it's, it's simply because of this. Companies aren't always profitable, and you no. are taxed on profit, not turnover, thankfully. Yes. Um, because, you know, you can have a, a business, say, like a trucking industry, where the yeah. overheads are absolutely huge yeah. um, to keep their trucks on. One, to purchase the trucks. Two, to fuel the trucks. Mm. Three, to pay the people to drive the trucks. Four, to maintain the trucks as well. Huge keep on service on the roads. Uh, so their profit margins are very, very slim. So while they might be turning over millions and millions of dollars, that doesn't mean it's ending up in their back pocket. Sure. And, and so people have got to be aware of that. Um, there's also other reasons why companies don't uh, turn a profit. Um, they're starting up. And yeah. very typically, businesses in the first two years will return a loss because all their profits are going back into the business. Of course. To one, pay off debt uh, to get it going. Two, to just try to get it to a point of growth mm. where it has um, sufficient turnover to be profitable. There's a thing what we call in, in the accounting terms called fixed costs or in business fixed costs. And these are the kind of costs that, you know, you just to keep the doors open, you, you're going to have every month. That's so right. it's your it's your salaries, it's your lights, electricity, it's your whatever it is it costs you to run that business. So, um, and it's going to be different for every industry and every kind of business. Mm -hmm. um, so. Don't jump jump on the the whole socialism bandwagon when you hear people say um, these companies aren't paying tax and that's bad. There actually could be very legitimate reasons. And the ATO in an article uh, that Travis sent me is trying to explain that, saying, "Hey, we look at it very very closely, mm. but you know sometimes if a company is reporting a loss in Australia, at least they're allowed to carry forward those losses, which means if you have a profitably the following year, the losses that they made in the previously can be carried forward. So they may have a second year where they don't right. have to yep. pay tax." bit of a grace period, sure. which is great because a business trying to get off the ground needs that because Absolutely. that business owner is taking all the risks yep. in, in the game yep. um, so that other people can, and they get their salary and they, they don't realise, I don't think people realise, and um, Travis, you might want to dive in on this, how much tax business people actually pay. It's not to you actually, because a, a, a employee doesn't actually physically have to pay the tax themselves the mm -hmm. employer pays it on their behalf if the ATO doesn't trust, trust employees to pay their taxes like that or the ATO wants to be paid first yeah, right absolutely we call that post-tax income 
whereas a business owner is in a pre-tax income place. So basically what they're doing is paying for their costs first and then they pay tax. So they have an unfair advantage from that perspective. But at the flip side of that, they are taking on all the risk in the game, right? That's right. There are many times where a business owner is sweating, like we've got payroll on Friday, we've got to pay all our staff mm -hmm. and the money's not just there. Where's it going to come from? Oh, look, if... I sweat like that every single week, <laughs> trust me. Uh, and it's a very big thing like, uh, that people don't grasp. And uh, and, I, and I understand why. You, you see big dollars rolling through all the time. It's obviously, you know, people tend to think it's profitable, but often it's just not. But there's an inherent massive advantage to having a business. You are doing so much for the community. You are employing people. You are providing a service. There is a lot, and there's a lot of money that rolls through there that way. So um, even if a business is not paying tax as such, it is. I think also people don't realise that the Australian Taxation Office has set up businesses in a very clever way to tax, uh, to collect tax on their behalf yes. in the form of GST. Mm -hmm. So we have to do what we call a BAS statement, which is a business activity statement, the acronym for it. And it's basically going, this is a profit we made and yep. we how much GST we had to charge the community in our sales. This is the cost to run this. And this is how much GST we had to pay to run that. And the two offset each other. Yep. Um, but you effectively have to, as a business owner, set those funds aside for every quarter, financial quarter, to be paid to the ATO. And you get behind on that, oh, the ATO will shut you down as a business owner. Yep. They yep. have no mercy on that. Um, I've been in situations where, you know, we, you know, like I, was, I remember one time I was late on my GST and I wrote to my accountant saying, hey, do you want to explain? It was because my wife had almost died of giving childbirth to her fourth child. And uh, something took a little more precedence yeah. than my, Funny my, my GST and reporting that on time. And they were understanding about that. They were, yeah. um, you know, yeah. they, I just said to my accountant, he just handled it all for me. He said, look, leave it with me. Um, and came back and said, they've foregone the fine that you've incurred and that sort of stuff. Right. So there is some leeway there, but, you know, you can't come up with that excuse every year. No. no. <laughs> it's a so, lot of babies, mate. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, look, uh, again, and it, yeah, it pains me to say this, but I am interested to, to hear what Travis's opinion is on this, mate. What, what are your thoughts? The, like, everything Derek said is is right, but he said right. it in such a Derek accounting sort of point of view. So <laughs> um, a, what a lot of people, and this is why I wanted to make sure um, what I th was really strong about getting this one in the show today, because... Most people, when they think about income tax, especially when it comes to corporations, they're like that's the, they think that's the only tax that a business pays. But there's so many things associated when you're running a business that you got to take into account. So let's let's run from setup. So you've got accounting fees, the business structures you got to set up. You got stamp duties on legal all legal fees, go, legal fees. You got all your setups just to have a correct business name. You have got all these expenses that comes up first. Let's say you're buying a piece of property or equipment or machinery or cars, vehicles, trucks, and all that. You've got stamp duty on that. You've got GST on that. You've got the wear and tear on everything there. You've got all your fees and charges on that. So let's say you hire, let's say your business has 10 staff members. You're giving away, mm -hmm. I think it's about, depending on the company you use, it's about 10% of whatever they earn. That's gross income as um, uh, workers' compensation insurance. So if they hurt themselves, on your time, you've got to put away every year 10% of their income to an insurance company just to have staff. So let's say a staff member is $50 an hour, just the, and I'm not even getting into superannuation yet either. So just to have them on the books, you've got to pay an extra $5 an hour per staff member. And if you've got 10 of them, that's $50 an hour per staff, sorry, per 10 staff, every single hour that they work. So you're looking at hundreds and thousands of dollars every year just an insurance to make sure if one idiot decides to burn themselves, like they did in the guy that the, the business manager got $650,000 fine, if some idiot decides <coughs> to like Paul Harris and set themselves on fire, you've now got to pay an extra $150,000 a year minimum. So there's all these other fees and charges, government charges, like Derek said, the BAS statements. So income tax or corporations tax for the businesses isn't the only tax out there there's heaps of them i was going through what we have to pay like what we do with our properties and that because we purchase properties we renovate them and then we sell them so we have this little thing called capital gains tax so if you're a business and let's say you buy a, a premise or a vehicle or something like that and then you sell it that that income mm -hmm. for selling the property can be considering what how you've done your deductions that can be considered as a expense or an income and if it's considered an income you've then got to pay capital gains tax on it 
So there's yeah. all these other taxes along the lines that a lot of people just don't take into account. They go, oh, they didn't pay any income tax. Oh, well, as a pay-as-you-go person, you're not paying corporations tax. So are it's we true. then able, to, as a business, to turn around and say, well, you didn't pay any corporations tax. So why should we pay yeah. income tax? Kimberly, obviously things are very different in the US. You don't do US, your GSC and all that sort of thing. Um, There's could, sales tax varies from state to state, yeah, which is I fascinating. Know. There's could, some states that don't have sales tax, which is really cool. It is. It really is. Um, could you give us a little insight on how it works over there? It's um, extremely complicated. And as you mm. mentioned, you know, it's different from state to state, um, how we pay taxes. But we pay taxes. It's very important. Yeah for the corporations to pay taxes. It is a lot of paperwork. And the best thing to do is hire an accountant to take care of everything, which is what I do now. I spent years reading every bit of the, the new taxes that were coming out and staying current with it, mm -hmm. just so I could make sure I could stay on top of it. But we, we do have a very steep corporate tax um, and the IRS stays on top of us. They audit us. They, you know, it, it's just a, a huge due diligence that we have to do. And it's not just taxes. We're, you know, we're liable for workers comp, uh, comp insurance that is, that is required. So there is just so many things that we are required to do to operate as a business. You just don't go open up a business and say, I'm, I'm open. You have to stay on top of all the regulations. And it's, I have come to the point in my life where it's just so much easier to hire somebody to do all that for me. I thoroughly agree with that. I, I've look, I've done the same thing and just put, um, you know, those issues in someone else's hands because you can't keep on top of all the changes. They're so constant. Well, I, I think you got to remember as an entrepreneur that reporting on money is not profitable. No. Making money, but doing the sales, getting the deals, that's profitable. And so one of the best hires I did was my bookkeeper who just yeah. keeps me in line. She's brilliant. She'll pull me up on stuff and that kind of stuff, which is what you want Absolutely. as a bookkeeper yeah. to go, you know, where's, how come there's 50 cents not balancing here? And I'm kind of like, well, here's 50 cents and you've got a lunch <laughs> type of thing. Um, but a bookkeeper will hassle you over 50 cents. Right. And, and that's what you need is someone to do that because yeah. they can pay, care about that compliance and you don't want someone who's kind of, uh, and look, as an entrepreneur, you do look at the big picture. You don't look at the little tin tax to a big degree. You know, yep. Obviously, it is important to look after the pennies. But at the same time, yeah, you've got that vision. And when you focus on that vision, sometimes you need somebody to pick up the pieces. It's really it. important in starting a business to keep your overheads as low as you can. Mm. It's really, as I call, skinny in the first few years. Yep. Um, because if you, I, I've seen business entrepreneurs make this mistake where they've got a huge vision and they get into contracts, particularly in leases, um, that they shouldn't do um, and overestimate how quickly they may grow. So it's mm -hmm. better to have to have the problem of, oh, we've outgrown this place, we've yeah. got to find another, than to be in a situation where we're like we're in premises that are too big for us. Um, and you're still paying for it. And you're still paying for it, yeah, per square metre. Um, um, but, you know, those markets change even in landlord um, rentals as, mm -hmm. as well. If you need a physical business, there's, there's businesses like mine that are totally online. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've always avoided trying to hire a place because I thought, what's the point of me paying $2,000 a month for me just sitting in a, in a different room? $2,000 a month. Jeez, man, I'll take that right any day. No, I was going back a few years. Yeah, <laughs> I'll admit. Yeah, A few I'm decades. Few <laughs> so um, one no, thing, it, but it's true. Yeah, go on. So one thing I just want to like really, really stress out here, this isn't a big live loving for big corporations and businesses and all no. that sort of stuff. So no, no, no. I just no. want people to understand that even though corporations aren't paying the taxes, they are paying taxes. Um, the the yeah. really bad thing is small businesses are generally the ones that get slammed because they haven't set themselves up properly. They're not geared up properly. They didn't do the hard yards right out the start. So what's happening is they're, they're constantly playing catch up. So the other problem, and this is now going into the realm of politics, out in the moment in Australia, when you send, let's say you're a major corporation like Apple, BP, um, all those sort of ones that are based in Australia, if you send say revenue over to another country which is running out of loss that is considered as a business loss so it actually reduces down your your tax obligations when it comes to income tax or corporations mm -hmm. tax right. so what they can do is send things to seychelles um canary islands or wherever where that's where there's tax havens internationally so to stop 
companies from doing that and making sure they're paying their fair taxes in Australia. We need to actually change the way we deal with international money transfers, especially for businesses. If you're, using, let's say, using Australia to cover the losses in another country. So what we need to do is make Australia the tax haven for Australian businesses. We should be in Australia the lowest tax rate for all Australian businesses. If you're pr predominantly an Australian business, mm -hmm. have the tax havens. Like, look, I'm talking 10% income tax in Australia because have it lower than any other country because that way they won't want to send the money offshore. They want to keep the money here. We, yes, we're getting yep. a lower rate of tax because more companies are actually in Australia and they don't pay the taxes in Australia rather than sending it offshore. We're not trying to get the money anyway. So there's yeah, Travis, a good example value. of a country that's a country that's made their work is Ireland. Ireland's done that. Well, I think I think you both have highlighted a very good point, and it's this: that in Australia, we have a tax system that punishes you for doing well. Yeah. Right. We mm -hmm. teach our kids work hard, you'll get ahead and do well, but when the reality comes to it, the more you make, the more you pay tax, the more you're punished for doing well. And it really is, a, a, the problem with this is, you know, people go, well, you know, everybody should pay their fair share. I think they, that sweeping argument mm -hmm. fails to realise one, the risks that are involved in starting a business and, and, and doing that sort of stuff, but it's also turning our best minds and best entrepreneurs offshore. Of people are going that's yeah. it we're pulling up the stumps as we say in in, mm. in cricket um we're going to go take our business elsewhere um because one the taxes are too high in this country and two there's too much red tape to actually do it we spend tape, so yeah. much time and money having to do stuff like reporting on our taxes um just keeping up with the legislation and the changes the government's always making i mean this is why so many options dealers and market makers in, yep. in, in the world that I work in pulled out of Australia because they're always changing the rules. That's and right. when you change the rules, all the lawyers have to then change all the compliance legals. And it was just going, it got to the point where these players are saying, you guys, as far as the market share in the, in the market in the world, you're tiny, you're less than 2%. Sure. We're gonna, it's too complicated to pull out. Well, uh, consequently, the options game in Australia mm -hmm. is so illiquid now. It, it doesn't have that okay. volume going through. So it, it's... And you want to attract money to this yeah. kind of environment? You yeah. want to attract big money into the game? That's not how you do it. No, no, you're pushing people away. Red tape particularly. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, in Australia, it's a major, major issue. Well, I'm going to uh, pull up stumps oh, on this on, segment, on, though. Oh, hang on. on. Okay, Mr. Carcel. Sorry, I know you can't see the screen in the studio, is there? So, yeah, no, Kim, no. because normally I'm in the studio, normally I'm monitoring the screen. So, Kim, far away, you had something you want to say. Oh, I just wanted to add that you are absolutely correct in the fact that sometimes our own countries punish us for doing good and that, you know, by taxing us more. Also, the problem that we have here in our country is there's a thing called net operating loss, which you're allowed to use. Um, so if you have losses while you're building your company, you maintain and monitor those and you can carry those forward when you start making money and then you can deduct those losses and you can carry used to carry that forward for 20 years but now um it's it, it's indefinite but that they also use that against people and our taxing system will trick you and make you believe oh you know you don't have to keep your records for all of these years but if you're going to use the nol then you have to maintain your records for the amount of years that you're using them. So there's just so many tricks, ins and outs. But I agree with you. I think that each country needs to start um, promoting and sending out messages to people to be more creative, go out there and, and start the businesses and be more helpful to the ones who are struggling. And I mean, there's a balance. That's right. But to punish yes. the ones who are successful by overtaxing you is not helping. It's not. Thoroughly agree. hundred percent. And agree. I think, look, um, any country that really genuinely wants to move forward needs to realize that you need to help entrepreneurs. You need to help small business. Most of the economy is small business. Uh, and it just tends to be certainly in today's society, this push to just it's all about corporations and everybody else is sort of superfluous. Just really quickly, one other tax that in Australia we've had is that the more employees you have, the more tax you pay for those employees. And I think it's a terrible tax because it it's discouraging people from providing employment. Um, and, and business people are the ones who keep people off welfare. That's right. right? We, we help provide the jobs and you punish business owners for doing that. I mean, that. 
trying to get rid of an employee has become even more difficult as well if they're causing problems. So it's just it's just compounding the issue. All right, time for that quick break. It's Edge Radio Australia. <laughs> no, Travis, we're going to do this, mate. Back in just a tick. It is the Greater Wealth here on Edge Radio Australia. And we're back, Edge Radio Australia. The Greater Wealth having a great little uh, day here. Lots of conversations, fantastic people. And uh, it's just nice to hear different opinions. You know, not, I, I always say this, I say it constantly, I'm probably, you know, a broken record, but you can't just always, you know, stay in your own fishbowl. You've got to actually have different opinions too. You don't grow as a person unless you hear, you know, Thing, even things that you disagree with, it's really important to hear them. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying today's show. Uh, we're all over the world, of course. We've got ourselves here in Western Australia, here in Wangara. Um, I think, Travis, uh, you know, you're probably somewhere up north at this point. I don't even know. Um, nah, maybe I'm, I'm trying to forget. I, I like you're to, in yeah. Yo, <laughs> no. I had a toilet and a car to fix, so I couldn't make it into the studio. So oh, I'm streaming in. South of Perth, uh, nearly bumper. If you're going to play hooky, you tell tell a good story then, for goodness sake, mate. Uh, and, of course, uh, now, Kim, where are you again? You, you've told us before. It's, it's one of the Carolinas, right? So Raleigh, North Carolina, United yeah. States. Fantastic. So we, uh, we're covering the globe a bit there. All right, let's jump into the next segment of the show. Derek, where are we going? We've gotten some clear clarity. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about um, centralized business digital tokens, CBDCs. Yes. Um, and this is, for those who don't know, still catching up to this, this is where um, the central banks <coughs> want to issue a currency as a digital coin, getting rid of cash. And I've always highlighted the problem with that is twofold. One, that if they can put it in a wallet, digital wallet, they can certainly take it out. Yep. And secondly, Excuse me. The secondly, the problem is that it's programmable. So, in other words, if you've met your quota as to you know if you've spent too much on fuel this week, and they say you're leaving too much of a carbon footprint on the planet, yeah. they can actually restrict your 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 spending on whatever. Um, and it's almost a control. It is a control yes. of um, people's behaviour mm, and yeah. um, and social standing. I've wondered in the whole, all this game how the retail banks are going to to play out and by the retail banks the banks that people go to to get a home loan yeah. uh, to also put their money in to park the salary how are they going to relate in this changing landscape to this and i've gotten a little bit of clarity over the week uh doing this with the large banks moving towards having what we call custody licenses of crypto and digital assets now this is really really big custody is basically somebody looking after your wealth for you sure the whole landscape of crypto was built on Bitcoin where you behave, became the custodian of your own wealth. So you would put it on an exchange and put it into a, a digital wallet. Um, it's also, you know, the, the banks emerge when, you know, people would travel around with gold and silver and these kind of coins and they were susceptible to robbers on the road. Mm -hmm. And the gold merchants would say basically, especially the merchants of Venice, come and bank with us will be the custodian of your wealth. We'll protect you. We'll look after you. And this is where the whole banking system um, started to come from. Um, with that, so the custodianship is basically, we'll look after it for you. This is to have that, you have to have a license. Mm -hmm. And so when you've got banks like this, the seventh largest bank of the world, HSBC, is now going into the foray of custody service for tokenized securities and digital assets. Um, so this is huge. This is, is a really, really big deal. Um, initiated by US banking giant BNY Mellon in 2021, they also went this way. And what's interesting is the company that's actually doing it. It's a Swiss crypto custody firm called Mataco, wow. which was acquired by a blockchain startup called Ripple. Now, Ripple is a cryptocurrency coin um, that has always set itself up to be able to target the banking sector it's yes. basically trying to challenge the swift system the clunky system from the 70s mm -hmm. of moving money internationally okay which takes two three days ripple can do it in three seconds on the blockchain right, right. and we're talking millions and sometimes trillions of dollars so this is a disruptor to that industry now to do that to take on the world is a really big deal because you have to get all the licenses you have to get the banks to cooperate with this technology and you have to get also, also probably even harder the governments to cooperate with this technology well they bought out this company called Mataco to have that which was a clever business move when they okay. did that um, providing storage for bonds and other securities in digital form the other one that's also jumping onto this other bank is Germany's DZ Bank, uh, the third largest in Germany. It's launched its own digital asset custody platform um, that they published on November the 2nd of this year, uh, 2023. So you've got that 
custody license from the German Federal Financial Supervisory Authority in June. This is where we're seeing these kind of players move the chessboard, the, the pieces on the chessboard, oh. and how they're setting it up. So they're going, and, and think about it, it's not efficient for centralised banks to do the retail stuff. You know, they don't want to no, be no, dealing no. with Mary who can't get access to her digital crypto wallet for whatever reason. Sure. They don't want to deal with all that stuff. It's beneath them type of thing. It's not the way their business well, lies. They, they don't want to deal with Mary. <laughs> What's that? You're beneath me, peasant. Oh, it's so like that. Honestly, <laughs> I went in there. Okay, I went into the bank to put cash in last week. Forty-five minutes to put cash in my bank, and I and I also laugh about this when I'm putting cash into the bank, and uh, the the um they're asking for this ID. Like, right? if people are coming and putting money in my account, let them is my advice. Mm. I don't need ID. Just yeah, let me let me put money in my own account. But just the the the, the retail side of things, and I know oh, this is related strangely, but. You know, this is, they don't have time for the everyday customer anymore. The small person, you know, putting in a small amount of cash. This transaction, I think that this is, to me, you talk about moving pieces on the chessboard. Mate, I think this is upturning the table. I really do. I think this is a whole new game. Yeah, I, I think chess is kind of over to a degree. Well, yeah, it's kind of, we're seeing where it's moving to. We're seeing how the retail sector will now operate. I mean, HSBC is also is more of a big platform. It, it, it's more your big business type is it, investment type customer as well it's not you see it at the airports and it advertises yeah, yeah, yeah. itself as an international type bank but it's not not the common one that most people will go down to and do that but having said that it's the seventh largest bank in the world yeah so you've got to look at the different sectors these banks play in as well and we saw the collapse of certain banks in the united states of three of them mm. um mm. this year and a lot of those were exposed to a particular market share. So a lot of them were crypto companies um, that were, they were exposed Ooh, to. Or yeah, servicing. a lot of Silicon Valley kind of related stuff. Correct. And so they, they become niche in their own mm. way. Sometimes those niche ones have certain vulnerabilities to the asset risk that they have there as well and the customers they expose themselves to. Okay. Um, but, yeah, in Australia, because of a population so small, we mainly have four big players and a yeah. few couple of handful of alternatives to me i mean hsbc team seem rather to get into a lot of markets like with um secondary products like as far as they've got others that don't necessarily trade under their name and then you go oh look look at the paperwork they're underwriting this that so yeah, i can understand why they're a big player because just yeah they sort of sneak in the back door and all the well we have a lot of big players the commonwealth bank in australia is a huge bank yeah in terms yeah. of global terms as well westpac's okay. up there as well i mean but they have a huge market share of the Australian market in particular, okay. but they also have international interests as well. I mean, what these, what people don't realise is these banks lend to each other mm. as well. Yeah. They underwrite different things. And we're talking not just, you know, putting your money in a bank account. We're talking about other financial products like um, insurance. Yep. There's a big one in the game. There's a Imagine. lot of lucrative money in, in the insurance game because it's betting on you paying every year and not actually, you know, having a claim. Yep. You do that often it's, enough. It's a with, bet. It it's is. A bet. It, it's a bet that, that you won't claim that there'll be no risk and they know that they're going to lose on some of those bets um like a casino yeah, that's right. but you they know that you're going to keep renewing uh, your insurance but the house always wins mate so make <laughs> no mistake about that and we're not just talking house and general insurance and car insurance we're talking life insurance tpd yeah. trauma insurance all these sort of tpd being total permanent disability yeah, insurance. Trauma insurance what is trauma insurance that's like Look, if you get a heart oh, attack I can ask oh, that okay. one really well aaron so, so trauma, trauma insurance right? that's what was that mate no I've, I've had to make a claim on that when i have my motorbike accident so what really? it is is uh, yeah, it's a when you, in a situation that happens that permanently takes you out of the work, workforce. So cancer is one, heart attacks, uh, okay. missing limbs. So if you cut your finger off or your thumb off, they don't count it as it. But if, let, let's say you cut your hand off, like in an industrial right. accident, and you don't get the workers' comp insurance because the boss didn't do the right thing, didn't have the insurance because he couldn't afford it, your right. trauma insurance will cover you and they'll pay 70% of your income for the rest of your life. Or generally, okay. they'll just pay you okay. oh, yeah. I need trauma um, insurance for every time I go in the bank. That's the end of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> unbelievable. Kimberly, um, in the, what's the US take on... Uh, we do a couple of shows here which are, uh, have opened my eyes unbelievably. So we do a show called The Crypto Hour of Power. It's on uh, every Tuesday at uh, 1. We also do Making Money with Cryptocurrency uh, on a Friday at 4. I've got to think about things. Now, both of those delve into crypto in a different way uh, and learning more and more about how that sort of, um, I don't know, interacts with, with, fiat, with the traditional system. In the US, are you seeing... A big change in the play between exactly that relationship between crypto and the, the fiat side of things 
you, you know, you have the youth who are really trying to push the crypto. And then you have, mm -hmm. you know, us who, you know, the older people, um, we're still a little leery about it. I have a lot yeah. of friends invested in it. So, I mean, there's a mix. Um, the government's not too happy about it because, you know, what we were talking about earlier about taxing it. Um, mm. They don't know how to keep track of it. There's no standard. There is no universal standard crypto. And I think whoever comes out with a universal standard crypto will land the the all of all cryptos and it will make things easier. I, I thought it was going to be a great way to be able to uh, enter exchange um, with other countries, right? To do business with other yep. countries and travel. But it hasn't found that, that hook yet where it has become a international universal standard. So okay. we're struggling here on how to make it work. I've been, you know, I have friends who've been invested in it probably since 2008. So wow. it, it's interesting to watch how it has, you know, it rises up and then it crashes. So, sure. I mean, it's just, um, it's not as sturdy investment right now. I, I see it. I think the Wild West times of it, and again, I mean, I'm speculating here, but to me, they seem to be over. Like the, the big fluctuations don't seem to be as bad as they once were. Um, you've you've delved into this a little bit as well, Travis. Well, what are your thoughts? Um, first of all, going back to the banks being the custodians of cryptos, that kind of like defeats the purpose of it of having. That, that's how I see it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, cryptos was always the digital cash, like especially Bitcoin, Ethereum, a few of the others, um, the Dogecoin. Even though it was a joke coin, it was actually pretty stable. Um, it, it was supposed to be untrackable, but we're finding out it is traceable. Like a lot of criminals are being found because they are actually tracking the cryptos, which are supposed to be untrackable. Um, so situations like that, and it's not so much for people like wanting to do nefarious things, like they want to steal children or do drugs and stuff like that. It's more people who just they don't want the government involved in their money. So mm. and they're the ones that are getting caught out. So um, I, I, I I'm really not a big fan of having a bank controlling my cash let alone if i've got cryptos or anything like that um I, I love the fact that it's getting to the point where you can actually now buy brendan from the um tomorrow show at one o'clock uh crypto hour of power he's yep. also showing me about this thing where you can actually buy physical property with your crypto so make sure you do tune into the show because he covers things like that um That's very cool yeah. it, it's so it's opening up all these new revenues of income streams using the crypto and I think there does need to be, like we have the US dollar that currently is the uh, reserve currency of the world. I think Bitcoin is probably going to be the closest one to being the reserve currency for the crypto markets. But I, I don't like the fact that there's going to be banks controlling and holding your money. No, I, I, think, I think the weakness of Bitcoin, if you look at the technology, is it burns up a lot of energy. To produce. Yes, to produce. Does. And it's it's not as efficient as some other crypto coins. Sure. So you yes, it's been the granddaddy of them. It's been like the US dollar as far as uh, foreign exchange is concerned. Yep. Will it still maintain that? I don't know. There's there's been other ones that have come on that technology is more efficient. Um, mm. But certainly, um, cryptocurrency has exposed to the financial world not just the ease of custodianship and for users. And, and and look, there are weaknesses to that as well. There's a whole bunch of, you know, a whole chapter on, uh, you could do a doctorate on um, cyber security. And Kimberly, you'd, mm. you'd, you'd be more yeah, over that than I would in terms of the weaknesses of crypto and, and that. But what it has is shown the inefficiency of administration costs within the banking sector sure. and other businesses mm. as well. It makes it far more efficient. It removes a lot of those costs. Um, mm. The privacy is a big issue as well. Mm -hmm. People are saying we want privacy back. Governments have been caught out, as Kimberly has highlighted. How do they tax it? They always want their fair share of it. Mm -hmm. But we've got to remember too that it's not just looking at crypto as far as investment is concerned. It's so ex exchange um, in terms sure. of um, using it as a currency. So it also fulfills that purpose. And I think that's where the banks have been scrambling. Um, and there's been a lot of suggestion, as you know, of having a, a stable type coin yeah. where it is not susceptible to so much of those fluctuations. And they often pair it with a fiat currency to do so. Yeah, well, uh, and there's taking place now where you can actually go to sports stadiums, you can purchase your 
your, your hot dog and your, your drink um, on crypto. There's a, that as that gets to be mass adoption, and yeah, and I think that one side of crypto will be the investment, and one side will be currency to a degree. I, that's sort of how I see it. It'll be interesting well, to see how it will be. Yeah. Well, and that's the that's the point. I mean, yeah, 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 I'm talking long term. Paying capital gains tax on buying your hot dog and your soda no. pop, right? That that who wants that? Exactly. And, and that's how a lot of governments are treating this as a capital gains yeah. tax event. Of course. And so the, the, they're scrambling to keep up with. Well, well, what do we do with this? How is it defined? It's really opened up the game. But what we're seeing is that when you've got big players and investment firms, like I've highlighted, who are now applying for custodian licenses of crypto and digital assets. That is a big flag okay. and saying, hang on, this is now getting mainstream adoption where it's yeah. been fringe in the past. That's right. I, I think that is the, the thing to really right. take from this. This is this is literally the system saying, all right, we accept you. You're no longer the you know the redheaded stepchild, okay? You yeah. know, you, you're loved to be right. brought in. Yeah. Let's throw it down to Kim. She's got a comment. Go, I Kim. have an input on this. If someone... It's right now, interest rates on credit cards are so high and they're charging both sides of the transaction so high. People are, they have stopped accepting credit cards here in the United States. Like they want you to come in and do cash only. You know, the, the nail salon, the, the small independent businesses. When I go to the farmer's market, they all want you to pay in cash only or Venmo only. So I think if you can find a cryptocurrency that could replace the credit cards as they exist today, you will find something that you that is a great investment for you. It's going to have to be right. somebody who really knows how to take and run with it. But it's got to be, you, you know, to be able to do the, the cash transaction, maybe some lending. It would be great to find a... Um, a crypto lending machine. Um, and I think that you could do it with low interest rates and compete against what the Federal Reserve has destroyed here in the United States. But I think that's what's going to win the crypto market right now because the credit card industry has just gone stupid crazy. Yeah, I'll agree with uh, Travis on and for that matter, you too, uh, Kim, rather, uh, is that um, the issue is it's, crypto is becoming the new cash to a big extent. Exactly. So a farmer's market, a place where you used to traditionally use uh, your cash, you know, it's becoming that. Because people here, they like the convenience of having the card, but um, we certainly don't like the fees. We're going to have a very quick break. Be back really, really shortly. It's Greater Wealth here on Edge Radio Australia. It's Edge Radio Australia. Time to get back for our final segment here on Greater Wealth. Uh, I'm going to jump straight to you, uh, of course, Derek, because you've got a story hot on the old apple there. And... Yeah, we've been talking about how the changes are happening as far as the crypto market is concerned. And banks now, big banks, mm -hmm. are applying for custodian licenses within the different jurisdictions. I want to highlight, though, there are some negatives to this of course. as well. And, and let's face it, you know, a technology in of itself is is, is generally neutral. It's, it's what it's used for, yeah. whether that's good or bad. So radio can be a great in terms of giving out you know, in television, uh, communication, it's positive news, et cetera, but it also can be used for wrong. I mean, oh, I've had to delete some some stuff that somebody's put on a Facebook post uh, on one of our sites, and right. you know, I've been having to get in touch with our admin just before going away and going, we banned this person from, from, from engaging with us. Wow. So, you yeah. know, it, it's neither good or bad, but it's how it's used. Everything's got a top of bottom. I'd like to... Back. I'd like to throw to a, a, a general, a very interesting uh, European Parliament member who uh, is called Rob Roos. Now, he's had a lot to say in yes. the past, and I've always taken note of him because he's one that doesn't fly with the mainstream. He actually mm. is thinking uh, and is, is really out there. It comes across as fighting for the, the everyday uh, person out there. Yep. We've got some footage of, of what he has to say. I just left the room where we had the negotiations about the digital identity and I have bad news. The Member States and the European Parliament came to an agreement. That means that probably not far from now, the digital identity will be uh, a fact in the European Union. Right after this agreement, Commissioner Breton said, now we have the digital identity wallet, we have to put something in it. And what he meant was the digital Euro, also known as the central bank digital currency. And this is a very bad development. They always promise us not to make this connection. And even uh, a lot of experts, 
privacy experts and security experts warned also last week this is uh, a, a very uh, bad idea for our privacy and our freedom. And still this digital identity is pushed through. But it's not too late because we still have to vote on this in the plenary. So what you can do, send your MEP from your member state an email and tell him or tell her that you are against this tool. This is really, really important to understand what's going on here. Digital ID. Now, the problem I have with this, and I actually agree with um, Rob on this point, is that where does it stop, right? You get a digital ID when applying for having banking. Then do you also have to use it when you're getting um, health care? Yep. Do you have to have it when applying for um, all other transactions with other businesses? Where does it stop? And we saw the problem with this, of course, during that <laughs> 19 um, segment, and I <laughs> say that for a census on our <laughs> platforms, um, you know, where you had QR codes to check in here and there and everywhere, uh, really threatening the freedom of movement privileges um, that we as a society have. This is a social credit system, simple as that. You know, you can dress it up, how you can put whatever frock you like on it, it's a social credit system. So uh, what we're trying to do here is how do we get the balance between having the ease and freedom of this new technology that's available to us while protecting the everyday citizen in engaging with it? This is a challenge for politics. No, you can't. Not with the current politicians. Sorry, this is where I get, this is my, my, my feel. I, I love this shit. So... <laughs> The current politicians, doesn't matter what country you're in, there's no politicians out there that is going to tell the truth about this shit, that every single one of them is going to abuse their authority. Every single one. So we saw it in WA. We had some of the harshest lockdowns in the world. I think only Victoria beat us. So when the you had to have your QR code scanning in every time you went to a place, you had to scan your QR code just to track COVID. So there was an assassination of a bikey boss over in WA. So what they do... They weren't using the QR codes to find the perpetrator. They were using it to find witnesses, people who were totally innocent bystanders. They were hunting them down. Uh, and I know this because one, one of my neighbours was actually out the, um, the drag strip where the shooting occurred. So he gets a phone call from police saying, oh, did you see the shooting? And he goes, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, we know you were there. You, you scanned in. And so that they've already, and when the police minister was questioned about this, they said that their reasoning was we're using it to catch a murderer. They weren't using it to catch a murderer. He lied through his teeth. They were using yep. it to find yep. witnesses to build a case against the person. They already knew who did it. There was like, so in this regards, we know for a fact they're going to abuse their authority. If they go to whatever standard it is, they are going to abuse their authority to do whatever they want. So I, I personally feel that every single person, doesn't matter whether it's Australia, UK, Finland, America, Canada, wherever, I don't care. This needs to be blocked because it's worse than putting an implant into your hand because they'll track you. But already your, your mobile phone, they track you wherever you go. You yeah. This is this is going to get to the point where, oh, you've travelled too far so you can't buy petrol. You've smoked too many cigarettes for your own health. You're not allowed to have cigarettes. Oh, where's this money going for? We suspect that you're buying marijuana, so we're going to arrest you on drug charges even though you haven't done anything wrong. So they've got no evidence. They're just going to use your behavioural patterns to make crimes. If you say something they don't like, then I'll make a crime up against you and nail you for that one. So, no, this is utter bullshit. I think Australia as a whole needs to leave the... Um, the United Nations and just say, no, nah, we're out. You guys are going too far. Well, the United Nations seems to think it is this, well... The world yeah, government is not. Yeah, exactly right. And it really... And it, look, it was put in place to, you know, um, obviously stop you know, World War II uh, from happening again. And to be frank with you, uh, to yeah, me, it seems to be the main catalyst for World War Three that we're heading for, towards. So, a lot of, sorry, a I, lot I love of this, this one. Oh, sorry, I, I never wanted to bring up Ukraine, Russia in this one. So um, what's the military force of the UN? NATO. So mm -hmm. what's NATO do? They had a peace agreement not to invite Ukraine and a whole heap of other countries because of, as part of the peace agreement, they were going to keep a barrier of countries between Russia and the rest of the world. So what's right. NATO do? Hey, Ukraine, come join us. No worries. Let's just break the peace agreement that's been in place for, for, century, uh, for decades. Like the United Nations is arguably yeah. responsible for all the current wars that are out there at the moment. 
So oh, I don't think there's an argument here. I think they are absolutely responsible. I think that the use of NATO as a, a uh, well, basically a military force and the fact that exactly what you're saying, the fact that they've broken that border, that agreement, that is an act of war. Um, yeah. And I know that, you know, how people have a go, oh, my God. It's it was caused by NATO. And unfortunately, Ukraine just got stuck in the middle of it. And we're yeah, yeah. taking that a step further, it's actually the citizens that are getting absolutely destroyed in this situation. And neither Russia or thing. NATO are casualties. So. People are dying, right, because of the act of war that was actually, as I say, started, run and fired by. Look, Putin, for all his failings and, and negative side, he told them. He told them, don't do it or there will, there'll be consequences. He told them what he'd have to do. And I don't see he had a lot of options, to be what, absolutely frank with you. Well, the digital ID thing is concerning uh -huh. because, I mean, we saw it pushed through in Australia that anyone who was starting a company um, had to get a digital ID, Yes, all directors mm -hmm. of companies. And I think what the intent was there is we've pushed, the business people are more pretty gutsy when it comes to, to life. They fight for their freedoms. They fight for their businesses because they're putting food on the table for their families well, and their employees. So they're used mm -hmm. to doing the hard knocks. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the attempts was if they will comply, then the rest of the population may comply. My issue with it was this, is why do you need it? Yeah. Because you already have a tax file number. Yep. You already have um, various, you know, the business, you have an Australian business number, an ABN. Um, you have all these things tracking the business activity that you're mm -hmm. doing already. Who's wanting this digital ID? And now that it's being pushed internationally, mm -hmm. I mean, I said this to my account at the time, is it a foreign body that's wanting this information? Because there's really no, I can't see why there's a reason within Australia for wanting that. That's right. And I think that's the big concern here. When you've got nations banded together, as you do with the European Union, who's actually in control? You just have an association of governance uh, oh. that's going on. And the, war, the, the clouds, the, it's being muddied as far as the, the sovereignty of those nations are concerned. What sovereignty? What sovereignty? There is no way in the world Australia is being run by Australians anymore. There is no way that the US, I mean, if anybody thinks that Biden is in charge, you're a fool, right? Oh, you're thank a damn you for that. I agree. And I, I want you guys to understand something. This is my background is um, telecom, datacom. Um, it's what I've worked in for my whole life. And I try to tell people, you were being monitored from the day digital telephone came around, you know, before these. And these make it even worse, okay? So yeah. when you agree to your cell phone contract, they're tracking every move you make. They're capturing every data and every word you say, and it's all stored in a, a cloud. We all know about the cloud, but it's all stored somewhere to, only to be used against you when they want to use it. So this digital ID is more about, like you were mentioning, about a global control of people and data. Mm. But I've always had concerns about the fact our customer service reps are in countries that hate us. And, yes. and customer service has access to be able to turn my phone on and off, my landline on and off. And these are and if, if somebody who really wanted to take out a country, they would mm -hmm. do it by taking out the communications. In seconds. So Look, what people yeah, like they did with Optus. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm, or, or, hang on. We, don't, we don't even talk about the fact that NAB was taken out the next day, by the way, to an extent. Which is a bank. So, a bank, yeah. Know. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's because NAB uses the uh, Optus network. So, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, for the there, next day. A, sort of... Half the government bodies use. So, so Kim knows one of our, our, I think they're number two in Australia, our second largest carrier in Australia, Optus. Um, total okay. total mm. shutdown. Over 10 million people lost access, including businesses, government entities, major banks, major corporations. Anyone that was using the Optus network was locked out of absolutely everything. So, yeah. Now, if that was it, a it hacker, if that was a hacker who did that to prove that we need to retain cash, big thumbs up for you. Um, but I sadly don't think it was the case. But honestly, one thing I did find is a great positive is over the last week, because of that, several places I've gone have insisted on cash. Love it. Fantastic. Um, but just on back, flipping back very quickly about the, you know, we're obviously about the, the digital currency and the, the fact of the credit score situation. And it's just the, the sale of your information. I was having a conversation with my girlfriend just days ago. Okay, we're sitting there and the phone's on, obviously sitting there, but the TV was off, right? We had this conversation. I turned the TV on and it was on YouTube. 
the moment we went, I turned the TV on, it went to the subjects we were talking about in our conversation. There's no way in the world that the, you're just like, please, if you're not seeing this, open your eyes. Really? That's right. what I've been trying to tell you. All of this has been pre-designed for years, years and years. Back when I first helped build the first digital multiplex switch, all of mm. this was all about that. It's very scary. Oh. I mean, it and, and so, you, know, you know, all I can say is go find Skylabs and destroy it, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's Sorry. a lot of truth there. <laughs> One of the um, things I've just done, you know, just popped it up on the screen for people as well, for the ones that are watching and they don't have access to our comments. And by the way, for the people watching, you can send us comments. We will answer them. Um, there's a website called weberinsurance.com.au slash data breach list. It's every single data breach in Australia since 2018. And I've just had a quick look on there. Oh, Australian geez. Federal Police in September had a massive data breach. University of Sydney, American Express back in August. Uh, AUDA, uh, August, Tesla had another one in August, Judo Bank and REX uh, had a, another breach in August, Australian Department of Affairs, um, Chat GPT had a data breach back in July, MyGov, which is the controlling entity for all of our data, had a breach back in July. Oh, guess what? Uh, fraud enabled MyGov security gap cost Australian taxpayers $500 million. Okay, so oh, why, that, why is it no, like this in the news? Like, dude, that's not that. Don't get excited. That that's about the cost of a referendum, mate. No big deal. Look, yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Like, um, <laughs> people aren't aware of how susceptible we are, especially now that AI is getting even better and better. It's not the AI yeah. that's the problem; it's the person behind the AI that's the Spot problem. On. So. People need to be ready for, and sorry, I'm, I'm a bit of a computer geek. I love this sort of shit. So <clears throat> quantum computers are now becoming commercially available. So to put that into perspective, your standard computer is like reading a single book at a time or maybe 16 books at a time because you've got a 16-bit processor operating in your computer if you've got a half-decent one. A quantum computer is like reading the entire library at the same time and transacting on every single book that you're reading at the same time. It's like doing a thousand crosswords at the same time. So such a no nerd. computer currently will be able to beat a brute force attack no. from a quantum computer. So you need to start getting you ready for when quantum computers come out. Personally, if you've got a choice of upgrading to a quantum computer versus buying a new car, do the quantum computer, get your security ready because it's the only way to keep your personal information safe and keep your bank accounts safe and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, that's my All opinion. right. Thank you so much, all of you. for Jeez, great show today. Kim, have you got something you'd like to say on our way out here? I, I was just going to say that's not the only way to protect yourself. It's probably the worst way. Um, that is my background. So please be careful. There's there's ways to protect yourself. But as we've proven, the chip that they put in your credit card or the PCI compliances, they've only made things worse for the people and the consumer who are honest. You need there are ways to do it. Of course. Look, I'm, I'm just working how to write shell on my old calculator. So, um, you know, I'm a bit behind the times on this one. Thank you all so much for being part of the show today. Has been The Greater Wealth here on Edge Radio Australia. Mm -hmm.